can start, we can go just say and spell your name. All right, my name is Sean Lily Wilson. Sean is S-E-A-N. My middle name is Lily, L-I-L-L-Y. Last name Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N. Lily is my legal middle name. It's my wife's maiden name. Cool. I had okay. no affinity for Richard. <laughs> Today oh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm right here. <laughs> I had. Uh, you yeah. didn't find out I had to yeah, say my you know, I, I just. I didn't. I, I felt like I was competing with you. With well, really was not, yeah, really other was other actually my mother's name. Oh, yeah? Yeah. All right. So. Very cool. Uh, you said a conversation, so. Today is Thursday, May 17th, 2018, and we're here at Full Steam Brewing in Durham, North Carolina. I'm Richard Cox, talking today with Sean Miller Wilson, Chief Executive Optimist, as part of the Wellcrafted North Carolina Project. So we'll start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, wow, you're leaving it that open-ended. I am leaving it that open-ended. Okay. <laughs> Should we take that in any particular nope. direction? Nope. Go okay. Excellent. <laughs> I am a Scorpio. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, let's see, I am uh, 47 years old, I've been married this year, we'll be married 25 years to my lovely wife, uh, Carolyn, and we have two kids, Echo and Sophie. Uh, just yesterday, the youngest finished uh, high school, so um, uh, that's that. We've lived in the area, the Durham area, since 1992, so I'm not from here originally, I'm from Pennsylvania, I guess, I kind of moved around a lot as a kid. But I uh, grew up in Pennsylvania, went to school in suburban Chicago. That's where I met Carolyn. Uh, we moved out here and we've stayed here ever since. Um, I have a love of uh, and, and an interest in kind of creating change and, and, uh, and, and rabble rousing um, and doing things just a little bit differently um, than, you know, kind of following the standard path. So my career has been a long rambling um, you know, not 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 very uh, not very consistent, but I found my I found my passion and I found my love in, in craft beer, and it took me a little bit, but I got there. Cool. And how did you first become interested in the brewing industry? Uh, well, I was in grad school at Duke, and uh, I had just finished up the program, and a friend of mine who stayed in the area was a big craft beer enthusiast, and uh, I was a home brewer, and was very persuasive on this whole like you should try this beer and you should try my beer and like very beer uh, like uh, just one of those like evangelists for craft beer and I was like um, that's cool I drink craft beer you know because I buy whatever's on sale at Harris Teeter and and uh, and I thought I knew what craft beer was and uh, and he took me to a, a party he invited me to a party where there were all these uh, corked and caged beers and things that said batch number one and and um, bold flavors and I, and I'd never tasted anything like this before and I asked my friend what is where can I get these beers and he said oh you can't get them in North Carolina and I was like what what that makes no sense and then he explained this law that kept beer to under six percent alcohol you couldn't sell beer above six percent uh, you couldn't buy beer but you couldn't brew beer above six percent alcohol a, a, a law that had been in place since prohibition and I, I thought that was kind of a dumb law and and, uh, and and I started thinking as I was also getting into craft beer and getting him interested in uh, this whole world well maybe there's an opportunity to to, to try to change that and so working on that law change was my foray into craft beer I didn't think I would start up a brewery I didn't have any intentions of starting up a brewery um, but that's you know ultimately what happened um, so since you've already slid right into pop the cap um, for those who don't know what exactly was the pop the cap movement sure pop the cap was a grassroots movement that started in 2002 with um, three key people Eric Golam uh, Julie Johnson at the time she was Julie Bradford um, and myself uh, and a bunch of other volunteers and, uh, and, and craft beer enthusiasts and a key lobbyist Teresa Castrava so that group of us uh, worked uh, as, as volunteers as craft beer enthusiasts to, uh, to change a law in North Carolina a part of the general statutes Our original intent was just to strike a uh, clause that said and not more than six percent um, the legal definition of what beer could be and 
It took us about two and a half years of lobbying and pressure on the legislature, um, but we were ultimately successful with getting that law changed, and uh, the cap is now a more reasonable 15%. There's still a cap, um, but it covers about 99.5% of all beers that are made out there. So how would you describe the beer and brewing scene in North Carolina before 2005? Um, it was enthusiastic. It had the makings of a solid industry, but it was uh, it was handcuffed by an unnecessary regulation. We were one of five states with that regulation in place, and um, we uh, they were all southern states, and it was um, uh, hard to be a, a force. It's hard to be a legitimate uh, state for craft brewing when you have this uh, restriction in place. About a third of the world's beer styles uh, were illegal to brew and sell, and so um, that, that really, that, that again, it handcuffed us. Now, the enthusiasm was there, the bones were there, some experience was there with, uh, certainly with Highland and Red Oak and Weeping Radish and Foothills had opened uh, by then. Natty Greens had opened, I believe, in the in the midst of all of that, and so there was uh, a wave uh, and an anticipation that this law would change. Um, but it it was a different era. And what were you up to at the time? Well, I was unemployed. That's why I took on this volunteer job. <laughs> like I said, I. I had some extra time on my hands. The <laughs> translation was I didn't have a job. Okay. And so, uh, and, and, and then I actually did get a job. And I, work wise, I, I was working at the I was working at the Duke Alumni Association. I worked there for about a year, and I did like membership programs. And uh, it was a great job. It was a very um, manageable job. And so that afforded me some some time to to scheme uh, to to uh, to. To have the side project, um, but when I first started out, I was literally like trying to figure out how can I get into the craft beer world, and that's how I connected with Julie, uh, Julie Johnson, uh, her then husband was head of All About Beer magazine and what was called the Association of Brewers, which merged with the Brewers uh, Association. Mm -hmm. It was a there were two organizations, the uh, um, Brewers Association of America and the Association of Brewers. Those two merged uh, and formed the the Brewers Association, which is our trade organization. And he was head of that and head of All About Beer magazine. I was doing my networking, like, God, I love craft beer. How can I get into this? And I, I, I found out that just two blocks away from here was uh, All About Beer offices, um, and uh, um, basically just hounded them for a job and, uh, and 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 did some did some initial work with them, and then then did that work at Duke. So again, as I started, a sort of rambling career, uh, non non linear process, um, but. Uh, but that's the, that was my start. And so how did you, I think it was originally 35 people in the pop the cap? Yeah. So how, how did all these people manage to come together? Uh, through the power of email. Um, yeah, uh, this was before Facebook and before uh, a lot of like the campaigning kind of ease of, of like campaigning and, and, and getting people um, aware of um, you know, it was movements, right? So there was no hashtag associated with this thing. Um, but we, we just knew enough people uh, in our networks to reach out and, and especially Julie, she's very well connected in the beer world. And um, we knew enough people who had been mm, sort of rumbling about this change. And, uh, and we just started sending out an email uh, to as many people we thought might be interested in, in joining and figuring this thing out. And so uh, on a kind of miserable, cold February in 2002, uh, we got about that core group, 35, 40 people together at the All About Beer offices. And, um, uh, you know, not very many people ended up really being a part of that organization, but enough did that we had, there was enough of a spark. We were like, there's something here. And somehow through it all, I ended up uh, serving as president of it and, um, uh, and, and then building that group from 35 to, you know, what ended up being uh, for people who wrote their local representative or uh, uh, walking the halls, you know, definitely a few thousand people. Yeah. Beer brings people together, yeah. yeah. And that was a really fun thing about all this is that uh, it was it was nonpartisan. There were uh, libertarians, conservatives, uh, 
uh, liberals. Uh, it, it, it didn't matter. Uh, it, there were just there's this audience of people that were just passionate about about beer, craft beer, and um, wanted to see it change. And, and we were all um, all walks of life. Yeah. And I know you mentioned that your goal was to strike one line out of the law, but mm -hmm. when you were first getting together at the offices, did, what sort of expectations did you all have as far as like how long this would take or what you really could achieve? Or Well, we knew what the goal was. We just had no idea how to do it. And this is coming from a, a graduate of a public policy, you know, master's program. I did public policy and business at, 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 at Duke, and I had no earthly idea how to change a law. Um, we literally thought that that maybe a petition would work. Mm -hmm. I mean, in retrospect, it's so laughably naive. Um, it's it, as they say uh, in the South, "Bless your heart," right? Like we had plenty of "bless your heart" moments in um, in our early days as we tried to get this thing going. But that's where Teresa provided great expertise and also a very um, loving but direct like oh no 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 we're not doing that um and we entrusted her to go through this crazy process of of changing a law in north carolina uh and 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 following yeah again following her lead um but uh we had no idea how to do it early on now we knew what the goal was and we weren't distracted by any other agenda or um you know, language, it was very clear. All we want to do is strike six words um, from the, uh, was it six words and not more than six percent? Yeah, six words. Okay, I remember my talking points. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, all we wanted to do was strike six words from the general statutes. Uh, of course, it, it was a lot more complicated to, to do that. Yeah, I think you kind of touched on this, but we we're asking what were the greatest challenges in working with it? working with the organization to try to, uh, the grassroots movement, to actually get the laws, get to the point where you're getting the law changed? I mean, what challenges along the way were you facing? I would say well, there were many challenges. If you break it down like in sort of political science um, methodology, mm -hmm. you know, have the different actors, and um, the players were uh, definitely the Wholesalers Association um, who provided a uh, considerable challenge in both opposing and being neutral on this issue. They, mm -hmm. they were in a difficult position of having to appease a wide range of constituents, some of whom were against this law change, some of whom who were for it, some of whom had no idea what on earth this was all about, even though they're in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, because this is not something that the wholesalers were used to. Wholesalers, they're they're really good at moving efficient boxes of similar sized things. And this is coming in uh, as an industry and saying, oh, no, no, uh, what we'd like to do is um, ship trapezoids and tetrahedrons and, and um, polygons, and, and, and they're really just like, they would like to move boxes, right? And so um, th we were very different uh, audiences, a very different look at what beer was to them. And some of these are multi-generational staid families that. Um, are very happy with the, the opportunity that they have to um, control a part of the market. And those, some of those um, constituents did not want to see the law change. It's true. <laughs> they, they lobbied very uh, effectively in the background to try to kill this thing. That was a significant challenge. The Christian right was another significant challenge. Um, and uh, uh, this coming from somebody who grew up uh, in the faith community went to a religious school uh, 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 and, and, and just spoke a different language about um, beer than did the Christian Action League, um, who uh, was, was very um, uh, caustic in their, in their language. They're very passionate, but um, also uh, full of great rhetoric and, and leveraged their um, leverage th th their connections, the ones that they knew would be against it, um, as, as vocal opponents of the law change um, to try to uh, uh, throw out some scare tactics. Um, I think there was a lot of noise in that. I don't think it was particularly effective, but you have to navigate around that because if any one of those, oh, they're just looking to, to have something catch on fire and, and get people skittish because it is trying to change alcohol law in the South, right? And to do that on the, Teresa reminds us of this to this day, to, to be able to change that law 
on the first go around uh, is, is pretty remarkable. I um, mean, she would call it unprecedented. Um, but, uh, but you know, I think that's that. Yeah. So, and then, um, and then another constituency that was difficult was our own internal um, uh, audience, right? And what? So, clarify what that means. Um, uh, we we are a Apicap was. Uh, really centered in central North Carolina um, within, let's say, an hour's drive generally of, uh, of the state capitol. And I think the people who were inclined to see this change, who know um, a little bit about North Carolina's economic, or sorry, political climate, um, we just, we live in politics more in this area than do people in Charlotte and in Asheville in particular. Um, Asheville is somewhat separatist leaning, somewhat like on the mountain, leave us alone, we got this thing, we're Asheville. I love you Asheville, but that's kind of always been the, a little bit of the mentality and it kind of came into play with a little bit of a laissez-faire attitude towards trying to get this law change. Charlotte as a banking institution and a financial center doesn't really understand the political nonsense that happens in um, in in North in, in the in Raleigh, right? And I get that too, right? Um, but we we knew that we had to sort of play a certain game um, and work a a process to get this law changed. There was no way around it. Uh, it's interesting now you see the dynamics playing out with Craft Freedom, that who has basically said no, there is another way. We don't have to, but we're tired of the political system, and I get that because um, the wholesalers are uh, uniformly, almost uniform, uh, uh, against this that law change. That and that that of course is the the goal to lift the um, self distribution uh, cap in North Carolina. Um, but they're really entrenched and pretty united on not seeing that through, and they're very well politically connected. So they're going their own path on that, which I, I totally get. For us. We, we worked within the system. That caused some rancor and discord uh, from, uh, from other regions. And so we had to work to kind of create these, these local, uh, I, I'm almost tempted to call them cells, but you know, little pop-up groups um, that, that kept, that waved the pop the cap flag within that community. Holy moly, that was a long answer. That was a good answer. Um, so you mentioned you know, craft freedom. Um, for people who don't know what the craft freedom movement is, um, do you want to talk briefly about? Yeah, it's this ongoing movement now uh, to look uh, to to lift the alcohol cap on self distribution in North Carolina. Now, it's not on the amount that you self distribute; it's on the amount that you produce as a brewery. So, once a brewery exceeds twenty five thousand barrels annually, they no longer have the right to self distribute. We are a self distributing brewery. We're at about eight thousand barrels, so we're short and shy of that cap. But we would love to have that opportunity to grow uh, beyond that, and we support breweries like Noda and Old Mecklenburg, Red Oak, and others that w that are um, either closer to that cap or really have an active interest in are pursuing this um, this change. The method of going about it, I have my concerns on it. I I I, I don't know if, but I get it. But I have my concerns, and that's okay. I get it. I have my concerns. Those can coexist. So I'm kind of on the sidelines watching this one play out uh, and adjusting accordingly, wholeheartedly throwing our support to the people at the front in the front lines on this one. Um, but they are suing the state uh, to uh, uh, to basically state that the franchise laws and the self distribution cap um, are, I, 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 I believe, unconstitutional. Right? Would be the language. Yeah. Cool. So um, now looking back at Pop the Cap, um, is, is there anything you would change or do differently? I mean, it worked, so. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> it worked pretty effectively. Anything I'd do differently? I think we could have done a better job of um, working within the communities to, to, build, um, to build more trust of our intentions and our process, but that's a pretty small change. Um, we were always going to have uh, opponents, and it was fascinating political theater. 
And I wouldn't have changed that for a bit to hear some of the rhetoric that came out of that, that drinking one craft beer is like drinking straight vodka or that um, another, another representative said uh, something like that this law change is gonna lead to more, um, more deaths, more abortions and more academic suicides. Um, you know, literal, like actual things that legislators said to try to um, defeat this, this endeavor. Um, it's, I wouldn't have changed that for the world. That's, it's hilarious. Okay. But it was, it was also like invigorating, you know? Like if it was easy, if it was just like checking the box, okay, yeah, we get it. You know, like it would have been easy, but it's the fight that makes it all worthwhile. It's the stories that come out of it. It's those memories that are just like, they'll live with, they just empower me to this day. What would, you, what would you say is your best memory? Um, I mean, the best, uh, you know, since that was the, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, the best was when I uh, heard the news that, um, that the law changed, yeah. which is like the sort of the simple answer, right? But I mean, that, that was pretty great. The funny thing is, um, I was actually on a family vacation in Tennessee and I literally was coming out of a cave. Uh, so I came out of a cave, right? And not just any cave, but like, it was like, a, you know, you pay admission for a cave and you go on a tour and like, like a legit cave, right? <laughs> Complete with admission. <laughs> and I come out and my, my, my phone uh, was, was buzzing and, and, and lighting up and all of that and, and the law changed and, and everybody was calling me and texting me or uh, whatever happened back in the days of cell phones in 2005, but it did exist. It was a cell phone. I was getting some kind of notifications <laughs> and, and, um, and just that feeling of like, oh my God, it happened. We, we really did it. And, and that is the, it seems strange, like, well, why were you on a vacation? Shouldn't you have been there? But you don't know sometimes when, um, when, a, uh, when a bill is going to be taken up and, and, uh, and when things are going to happen and all that. But that, that was just such a joyful moment. And um, it was neat. It was with my family. And, um, uh, you know, we didn't go out necessarily because we were in rural Tennessee. We didn't go out and celebrate with a specialty beer or anything like that. But just that feeling of like uh, the the hard work that yeah that we saw through. And there's a million other memories, sure. but the best that would be it. Yeah. So, um, what did actually like the next day after the law changed? I mean, what actually changed? Did did people suddenly start? Suddenly, these fourteen point nine percent beers magically started appearing at. Well, we had an, a we had a really um, just a very sad spike in academic suicides, and um, and I'm just kidding. That's too soon. Still, um, uh, I mean, I shouldn't joke about that because I know you know things happen in, in life and all that. But but uh, but uh, yeah. So <laughs> so that's now on record. Great. <laughs> the snark gets the better of me. Um, Okay, so the first, like, the things that I really remember were uh, Highland Brewed, and I think they might have known that it was in the works, or they had it in the conditioning tanks or something, but I remember that first beer, it was the Tazgul, it was an Imperial Brown Ale, and I, I had it actually at, uh, of all places, at Top of the Hill, I think they had it on tap there, um, uh, and... Um, either that or I, I mean, this is where memory gets fuzzy. I might have brought a bottle to Julie or some kind of connection there. Um, but I just remember that beer in particular as a, um, as a malty, um, maybe 8% beer, nothing crazy, but just that first taste of something that was, um, had been illegal in North Carolina for 70 years that was made in North Carolina. That was by a brewery that I really respect, uh, and, and, and love. Um, that was that was fun. So you started seeing slight changes. Um, the first movers were things like um, Duval and um, uh, Mered Sioux and, and, and these these imports that came in, these Belgian imports. There, there was this first wave of like delirium, delirium tremens and and um, and so. Uh, yeah, that was that was those are some of the first things that, that, that happened. And then over time you would start seeing like actual IPAs. You know. I know it sounds 
I, I, I'm a little concerned that like this 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 sounds like you know oh back in the day you know but it's just weird to think about like, yeah you know like especially where we're at now you know and 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 I I think about this a lot not to jump ahead because because maybe this is a question I don't know but but so many people people in their twenties and 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 thirties and all they had no idea that this law existed right and you know what that's great. They shouldn't have known about this law. They they have no need to know about this law. There's no, I, I I love that we're talking about this and that there's a chronicling of this, but this law should never have existed. So there's no reason to celebrate, um, you know, the difficulty. I love the stories of like my experience and our experience coming through all of it. But by no means am I just like if you only knew. Like, it just it's beer so good these days, and we're so. Um, uh, lucky that um, I don't care that people don't know about this stuff. I, 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 I appreciate the chronicling and the documenting of it, but not from a you know from a you know yells at cloud kind of standpoint. If that makes sense. Yeah. Way to end the pop the cat part. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about full steam. Okay. Um, so you actually stated earlier that um, when you started pop the cat, you had no intentions of owning a brewery. So what what changed? I love the industry. I love the people. I knew that the um, that the industry was going to change. And part of our talking points with Pop the Cap, uh, when the question came up, uh, well, what do you expect the economic impact would be? We would always say we thought it would be around 300 jobs, right? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, well, maybe we can create a couple of those 300 jobs, right? Yeah. I laugh because just yeah. it's been a lot more than that, right? Um, we, we woefully underestimated the impact, but I thought, you know, I, I love I love this industry and the people, and, and uh, I always kind of considered myself a, an entrepreneur in waiting. Um, I just didn't, I wasn't ever quite ready. I didn't have the idea. And I also am not a, I'm not a technologist. I'm not an engineer. Hell, I'm not even a, a brewer, right? And so all these reasons I was like, well, I'm never gonna own my own business because I'm not that, person. I'm not your typical like works out of the um, garage and invents something, but that's such a fallacy. Um, I, and, and, and really what it took was me gaining my own confidence to, to break away and start uh, start my own thing. And, and but, but it came back to beer. I loved the industry, the people, and I, and I knew that there was going to be an opportunity uh, to, to, I wouldn't say leverage my experience, but to build upon it and take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And why Durham? Oh, why Durham? Um, well, we looked at a lot of other towns and cities, and I kept on coming back to uh, this this the city that I that I love that I first moved to in 1992. And um, I don't live in Durham now, um, but uh, but I obviously have a, a strong affinity for Durham, and um, I, it just has the bones of um, a physical space that worked for us at the time. Rent was relatively inexpensive. So we secured 14,000 square feet. We rent here, um, but um, it was a, a place that we knew that we could have good bones um, and good people to support the on-premise component of what we were looking to do. We looked at some smaller towns and, um, you know, say Hillsborough, Saxbahal, Pittsburgh, uh, but it kept on coming back to Durham as this place with great energy and, um, and promise. And at the time, I think Durham, tracked and craft beer tracked really nicely with each other both were kind of underestimated both were kind of rising a sort of uh, I wouldn't say Phoenix from the ashes but just the, a little bit of that grit and can-do spirit where um, a, a lot of people particularly 10 years ago or so were just like oh Durham you know why would you go there and, and make some um, you know unfortunate comment about the fact that this is a wonderfully diverse, gritty, and sometimes challenging city. Um, and, and craft beer, without trying to thread it to, you know, uh, but, but craft beer had, at that time, a little bit of a, you know, um, image problem, I guess. You know, like, what's craft beer? That's for weirdos, right? And it really, like, it's strange to think, but like, it was, it was, uh, it went from weirdos to hipsters to mainstream, right? And so we were in the weirdo stage then, and and uh, and and the 
a little bit of that Misfits Toys thing it just it just worked for for us to, to build out something that was pretty different for Durham at the time. So it, Durham very quickly made sense for us. Sure. And what was, I guess, down, downtown and the lo Durham area like in August of 2010 when you were opening the doors? Well, downtown was, was coming along. Um, there were some early movers in there like Rue Claire, which is a, a, on, a restaurant and ongoing, and, 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 uh, and, a, and a few other businesses. but. Um, but it's remarkable what is happening in, in downtown Durham. Now, we don't really consider ourselves downtown. We're just north of downtown in a little warehouse district. Um, and this area, too, was, was um, I mean, people would literally, like, come here and say, like, why here, like, in the early days? Um, but, uh, you know, like a lot of warehouse districts and, and a lot of that movement towards urban revitalization, um, there's um, a collective of businesses that are, independent or entertainment oriented food uh, nightlife what have you um, and so we've we've really seen um, a lot of success because we're complementary to things that that make this area um, vibrant and fun so motorco um, coco cinnamon gear street the pit accordion club surf club uh, these sort of this is like a neat little um, nook of, of durham that's like a, a fun place to hang out so were there any unique challenges you faced when you were opening? Um, no, 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 no challenges at all. It was a breeze, of course, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, first off, it was capitalization. I mean, just, yeah. just like the raising the money. I, I, I definitely had some um, come to Jesus moments where I was just like, oh my God, like we are not gonna make this. Um, and so thankfully some in investors have, you know, they, they came through and, and made this thing possible. Um, I did not start this with my own money. I, I, I needed uh, to raise money to make this happen, both um, debt and equity. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had never done anything like this before. Again, I'm not an engineer, so I entrusted a lot of people to help build this thing out, and we worked together, and um, it was, uh, it was a, a very stressful time, um, but it was wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. So why did you name the place Fullstein? Well, uh, there's there's a, a sense of optimism, a sense of purpose and pride that comes with a, a vision that we have of making distinctly Southern beer using local ingredients and this kind of plow to pint vision that we have that we're going full steam ahead. Uh, I have a lot of past predictions of the future. So the past predictions of the future were oftentimes um, full of optimism and hope and what could be. And our predictions of the future now are not so good. So there's a little bit of hearkening back to past predictions of the future. So there's this dualism, and that's why the F is backwards. It's like looking backwards but moving full steam ahead. You got my second question already. Oh, why is the F backwards? Why is the F Well, backwards? and the yeah. snarky one is because you ask. I like saying that a lot, except that no one ever likes hearing that, you know? Because <laughs> if it was like a forward F, like, you wouldn't be interested. But yeah, yeah the, the backwards F is, is um, I mean, there's multiple reasons of it. From a marketing perspective, I wanted something that was kind of iconic and bulky and easy to recognize at the tap. Just like, oh, you have full steam, yeah. boom, right? So that's like the marketing guy in me, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but also um, uh, the simplistic, easy to see uh, logo that stood for something and, um, and, and made you uh, what I call like a this tilt of the head moment. Like when a dog tilts its head, mm -hmm. when it sees something kind of unusual or hears a weird sound, it's like, oh, why'd you do that, right? The, uh, a backwards F is a little of that tilt of the head. You know what it is, but it's not what you think it is, and you want, want to know why. So that's an opportunity for a conversation to mm -hmm. just like, so why, why'd you make that F backwards, right? And, and that leads to just so many conversations that start with a logo decision, but goes into a philosophy and, and allows us to tell the story of why we do what we do here at the brewery. So you, you mentioned um, the, your uh, pile of pint for that plow to pint philosophy. Um, can you tell us a little about that as well as um, the southern beer economy? Of course, I'd be um, honored to. When I first looked at starting up a brewery, I didn't want to do just, um, I don't want to say just, but I, I wasn't necessarily passionate about replicating existing beer styles. I, 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 I didn't have a vision to do a, a German brewery or an English brewery or a West Coast brewery. Uh, West Coast style beers or whatever. I wanted to create distinctly Southern beer. I had worked at Magnolia Grill, uh, kind of a seminal restaurant uh, in the South, 
in, and I worked there in the early 90s as a, just as a waiter, but uh, the Barkers there, uh, Ben and Karen, uh, taught me so much about uh, Southern ingredients and marrying uh, drink, then wine, with seasonal food, right? And, and the idea that I had was like, instead of replicating existing styles, it's more interesting for me to create. What if, like, what if in that spirit of optimism and, and, um, and in visions of the future, what if beer was distinctly Southern? What would that look like? And uh, what if we used local ingredients? And what if um, beer was the crux, and this is lofty talk, I know, but what if beer was the crux of the agricultural economy? Because it used to be tobacco, right? And it's no longer tobacco. So can beer create opportunities for a Southern beer economy in a post-tobacco South? Right, and so our vision was to, and remains to this day, to use uh, local grains, local um, herbs and, and, and fruits, uh, vegetables, to forage, to connect people to the land and to one another, but to uh, create opportunities for wealth, for farmers, agricultural entrepreneurs, and for foragers. So now, how would you describe what is Southern beer? It's a deceivingly simple question. It's a very deceiving, yeah. I think Southern beer, as we define it, has a quiet confidence about it, mm -hmm. which is always fun to use that f phrase, quiet confidence, because it's like, hey, quiet confidence. We're, let's talk about our quiet confidence. But, um, but it, it's one of our core values at, at the brewery, and it's also uh, imbued into our beers themselves that they try hard to not try too hard, right? And so I was thinking actually driving in today not about this interview but i just think about stuff like where are we at now in 2018 in the craft beer world and i think we're in kind of a morning zoo stage of craft beer like remember morning zoo shows there was just like at least there's an audience there's a world of brewers and god bless them i, I they're fun but they're the morning zoo of craft beer it's just like bells and whistles and like you know funny sounds and fart noises and they're like look at me's right uh, tune into all what we're doing and that it's great i love them they're fun but like they're not always for me like i i, I like to me southern beer uh is 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 tempered it it's it's quietly confident it's restrained it knows that its place is as a component to community to food um, that it doesn't have to always be the center of attention, that it can work to enhance the moment, right? And so, and of course, the inclusion of local ingredients help, helps give it a sense of place so that uh, there's a taste, and I wouldn't say terroir, I mean, that's, that's, that to me has always felt a little overwrought for, for, for beer because uh, taste of place can be so uh, changed by the ingredients that you use, be it the hops or uh, the, you know, just the, whatever you add to it, it's going to have those flavors rather than the taste of earth, which is like what terroir really means. Um, but, you know, so this is the, uh, the Farrington Spring, a collaboration with the Farrington Inn and uh, restaurant in um, Chatham County, and it uses uh, Riverbend uh, uh, Appalachian wheat, uh, grown in North Carolina, uh, malted, in, uh, in Asheville, um, but also a significant dry hop. Um, the hops aren't grown locally because hops, it's tough to have that as a commercially viable industry. So one might taste this and not know it's necessarily Southern, um, but we try to highlight the local ingredient components in each beer. And our goal is to get to 30% uh, local and, and to, we may even be able to push that to 50% depending on our business model. Um, so uh, that equated to about $100,000 in local agricultural spending last year in our uh, local purchasing, uh, ranging from uh, ingredients grown in North Carolina. We do also include anything value added that was sort of um, manufactured or had, a, had an element of a value added process in the state. So just to be clear what that means, um, things like coffee. Coffee doesn't grow in North Carolina, but we work with counterculture, with Muddy Dog, with other roasters. But the vast majority of it is uh, are, are ingredients that are grown in North Carolina. 
Uh, I think it actually your your menu list actually has a percentage of how mm -hmm. much of each beer is locally. Sourced. Yeah, that's right. And you would never know by tasting, say, the unscripted, a uh, an India Pale Lager. You're not going to know that that's 88% local by weight, um, and that of course doesn't include the water. But that's all uh, North Carolina uh, grown uh, barley, um, and and not local hops. You're going to taste that as a as a as a hoppy, crisp lager, and the fact that it has uh, local ingredients as the base of it is. Um, means a lot to us. How we communicate that to the customer is a challenge. I think we could do a better job of, of telling that story even here at the Tavern, um, maybe more on social media on our website. A lot of people just don't care. They're just gonna have a rocket science. They don't know anything about our mission. Um, and that's okay, but uh, I, I'd love to, um, I'd love to be able to tell that story more and more about the importance of, of agriculture in North Carolina and to have people fall in love with that, not for our sake, for our sales, but to really do what we can to see this Southern beer economy through. Uh, we're very passionate about the Southern farm and um, beer just happens to be a vehicle that we express our passion for the land and for community. And you're also involved in locally and sustainability and community engagement efforts. Is there anything you want to say about that? Well, I think a lot of breweries are, and um, we just have our own unique spin on it. So we work hard to be a mirror to Durham as a progressive southern city, and we take pride in, in that, in, in, in being unabashedly progressive and for, uh, for standing for things that, that we believe in um, that reflect the spirit of, of Durham. Um, and. Uh, and so a lot of our uh, events uh, or uh, kind of political con uh, 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 opinions or fundraisers will have that uh, element to it if we're involved in it. For example, gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is, is evil and uh, it sucks and it's, uh, it leads to divisive things like, like HB2, which was a, a, a very negative thing for our state and was done only for political gains. Um, and so if we and uh, Trophy and others who are um, passionate about ending gerrymandering and getting fair districting in, in, in the state um, can help raise awareness, um, then, then if beer is that vehicle for getting people to think about this complex issue called gerrymandering, then, then we're doing our job, right? Um, we also are heavily involved in uh, endeavors like the Triangle Land Conservancy, uh, where we foraged for we regularly forage for ingredients on uh, this land that's that's managed uh, by TLC and forever protected from development. Um, if we can get people to think about wandering those lands and 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 taking advantage of this great public resource uh, for for thinking about what a black walnut is or what persimmons are. Uh, through beer, then, then we're doing our job. Right. Um, and Full Steam opened the kitchen in April of 2017? Yes. Um, what was the thinking behind adding a food program? What was your thinking? Is that I what know. you mean to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what were you thinking? Um, I don't know what I was thinking. No, I do know what I was thinking. It's just been its own beast, um, for sure. Uh, we relied very heavily on food trucks for our uh, food here for seven years or so, we were a place for food trucks, and that served us well until the food trucks didn't show up, and um, uh, and then we couldn't really tell the story of like how beer and food pair wonderfully together. Um, I'm not sure that we still can tell that story because we have to meet customer expectations, and uh, our patrons don't want anything too too fancy. So how can you really tell the story about how great beer? and food is when you're doing tater tots, I don't know. Um, but, you know, tater tots are delicious and if I'm at a brewery, I might order them, you know, um, as an example. So, so we've had some growing pains with, with food and um, I think we're finding our niche in our way. Um, but uh, I think a lot of it really just comes down to, we wanted to uh, be able to manage the customer experience and there were too many variables when, um, when food trucks didn't show and they, Food trucks kind of had a, a moment here, um, back, going back to Durham, and Durham's like kind of 
ascendancy, food trucks were a big part of the vernacular. Um, and, and now it's kind of a known factor, right? And so a brewery of, of our size, of our era and age, we have to innovate. We, can, we can't stand still. We can't just be like, well, this is who we are and this is what we do. Because even though I have this background, no one cares. Even though I have this history, no one cares. Even though we've had this track record, no one cares. It's, it's about right now. And I get that, but that means that you have to constantly innovate and adapt and, and meet customer, exceed customer expectations. Um, but invention is the name of the game. And so actually coming back to beer, that's a big part of why we do things like New England style IPA, right? Or I thought you were a Southern brewery, right? But why do you make a New England style IPA? Uh, well, it's, it's because that's what customers want. And also because they're delicious. They are very tasty beers, right? Um, and so while we have this passion for Southern ingredients, we also are mindful that we have to meet customers where they're at and what they want. And so we, I'm particularly passionate about the, the fusion of that where we can connect our love of Southern culture with um, emerging styles that are not, not from here. Uh, and so we have a beer that's coming out is a, a Paul Paul New England style IPA, which is um, a morning zoo show style of beer if ever there was one, just happens to be a radio station in the South um, and but I'm okay with that because it's going to be delicious, right? It's going to take native pawpaws farmed by Wynn Denson um, in Siler City, between Siler City and Pittsburgh, and, and, and marries that kind of curious, dank, mysterious fruit with the lively, juicy, buoyant uh, New England style uh, IPA, and, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So, how do you see Full Steam growing in the future? Well, we're in, we remain in the awkward teenage years. We're sort of frozen in time in this, like, uh, this awkward teenage era where I don't exactly uh, know where we're taking it. I have a vision for it, but the, you start seeing um, at, at this moment in time uh, the consequences of breweries growing too quickly. And... Um, I'm actually a pretty conservative person when it comes down to it. We've been pretty methodical about our growth, but we are at capacity, we're on inefficient equipment, and we're at a point where we need to figure out where we're taking this thing. So I'm looking at some options, um, but nothing's yet set. Ultimately, we want to be a landmark brewery for the South, but we want to be anchored in Central North Carolina. Definitely the movement is local, local, local. I don't think that's going to change, but I think we have a lot of opportunity to really um, to, to, to be the craft brewery of Central North Carolina, of this region, um, and, and hopefully beyond. Awesome. Um, so what is it like working in the craft brewing industry today? <laughs> what is it with your ambiguous questions? What is it like? What is it like? <laughs> well, um, it's fascinating, it's exhausting, it's ever-changing. Um, there's no laurels in this industry, so you can't ever you sit still and think like you've accomplished anything uh, or, or, you know, earned anything. Um, it's, it's very forward-thinking, very, very um, fast-paced. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we've worked well at creating methodologies and systems that that manage a bit of this chaos and so right now what it's like working in the industry is um, we feel like we've got a good handle on who we are what we stand for and where we're going and how we get there um, and so as a business even though it's it's the industry is ever-changing we feel very solid and anchored as a team mm -hmm. and we know what we're trying to accomplish and what our goals are um, I couldn't imagine not having that. Oh, well, I remember not having that because we've grown and matured as a, as a brewery. I've matured as a leader. And um, I remember those days when it was uh, way too frenetic and too stressful. So it's still very stressful, but there's a sense of, uh, uh, again, quite confidence about our ability to accomplish what we're trying to do here. Also, too, I've got to hand it to our brewers who just make great, delicious beer. And... Um, 
uh, very few missteps, and um, and they just they're. I mean, Brian and crew are just so amazing that they they really deserve the credit for anything that. If you ever think of full steam in a positive light, it's because of them. You know, I'm just the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. So, how how would you say then? based upon my vague question of what it's like to work today, <laughs> how would you can use that to compare it to what it was like when you got started? I mean, what, what as been? full steam itself or as the industry? How about the industry? Well, yeah, that's kind of a different take. Yeah. So the industry when we first started was a lot more like what could be aligned with that who full steam was. like what could be the sense of optimism and excitement and enthusiasm. Um, now craft beer is a known thing and there's great craft beer throughout the state, which is awesome. Uh, but I also think there's a sort of a smugness and, um, and a um, loss of joy a little bit amongst consumers as they just expect every beer to touch their lips to be an experience, right? Um, and I, I hope that we can return to a point or come full circle where the industry and its consumers recognize that beer can be very well constructed and well made, but it doesn't have to have 20 different ingredients competing for your attention. It can just be what it is, and and um, and uh, a sort of self-actualization about it all. We're not at that stage yet. We're we're in that like ah, look at us stage as an industry. Not universally, but there's a lot of that out there, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of you know just it's it's the good and the bad of the untapped and the and the ratings and all of that where um, you know. It, it, like a lot of brewers would say, it just it bums you out a little bit, you know, when when somebody uh, w would rail on a, a well balanced, well made beer that's just trying to be a good pilsner. All it's trying to be is a pilsner, you know. Yeah. Just let it be a pilsner. <laughs> like it, it's a weird industry if you think about it. Yeah. I don't, I don't need a hot dog, and I finish it, and I'm just like, it's pretty good for a hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all I got. No, no, it's just <laughs> it, it, it makes me think in a way about the wine industry and how yeah. that can be very much be that. Well, wine's come like yeah, but wine is a lot more chill now than beer. Yeah. Wine people are just like, yeah, there's a time and a place for every wine. Mm. Sometimes I really want to geek out about this this Hudson or this Edna Valley, this or that, or this, you know, first growth. But sometimes I just, I'm good. I'm good with this glass of Pinot. It's good. It's a really good glass of Pinot. Yeah. We'll get there. So speaking of getting there, we talked about currently in the past. So do you see a direction or a, that's sort of forming for the next few years in North Carolina craft brewing? Like five years? Like five years out what? Well, do you, do you, what do you see as trends maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll get to that point where it's just like, I think there'll, there'll be that sort of self-actualization and, 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 and happiness about um, the moment, right? Right now, there's a lot of um, right now there's a lot about beer for the chase, and I like beer for the moment, right? Um, that's just where my heart is, and that's okay. like beer for the chase is fun. Um, and do you know what I mean by that? Should I explain that? Go ahead. Yeah, it's like a self. -lead. Like a leading question. Would you like me to explain that? <laughs> of course you would. Of course. <laughs> Please explain that. <laughs> Thanks. You can tell I'm getting giddy from my one sip of beer right here. Um, beer for the chase is just like you know the race, the the the, the frenetic like getting in line and 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 uh, and and the trading and the tickers and the ISOs and search ofs and all that. You know, maybe five years from now, maybe. 20 years from now, we will have no idea what ISO and FT means. And you know what? Most people don't know what that means. And what it means is in search of and for trade. And those are all fun things of like, like the, there's a subset, but it's a very noisy subset of the industry. And I think a lot of those people will be like, cool, yeah, I remember when I was that guy. Because I was that guy. That's what got me into beer. I was that guy who literally wrote 
like on Beer Advocate, like I'm not sure I love Anchor Steam anymore. Like, has it changed? No, the recipe didn't change. I just was starting to discover other things, and I thought, oh, Anchor Steam is boring now, right? But you come back and you just appreciate Anchor Steam for its legacy and for what it is, and 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 um, for for the moment, right? And there are moments for a steam beer. There are moments for a good pale ale. There are moments for um, crazy, you know, macadamia nut coconut gozas, right? Um, but one isn't better than, than the other, mm -hmm. right? And I hope we'll get to that point um, where there's still this audience that's like, oh, I'm over here. Oh, you're into craft beer? Yeah, but I'm over here in craft beer. Oh, you're over here? No, I'm over here. And we are in, again, I said morning zoo. I'll use this other phrase that I use. We're in a Dada stage right now of, of beer. It's just absurd. It's so weird. It's Dadaism, right? But Dada can be beautiful. Right? It's just that there's all these other expressions of art that are also beautiful. Right? And I think we'll come full circle to realize that if beer is an expression of art, uh, we all are our own artists. Breweries are artists that have a palette that we work with in this genre. Now, us as Full Steam, we've evolved somewhat in our expression of that art. Um, just like a, I think a good artist doesn't get stuck in her own ways and create this, the same sort of art, redundant, redundant, um, but just challenges and pushes themselves to, uh, to, to new, in new directions. Um, I, I, I hope that in five or ten years uh, we'll, we'll take a giant chill pill and, and, and understand that there's, that, that there's been beauty in all of this, um, but that, that beer has its place as a moment in community and in, in with food, um, and it doesn't need to be the be all end all. Uh, the other thing that I worry about is that we don't get to that point, and that 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 there's a whole audience that's just like, oh my god, it, like, oh you're in a beer, uh, I just I don't get it, like, and and that there's a wholesale tailing off of it because it it, it has failed to become accepting and inclusive, which is what got me into beer in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, this was your third year being a James Beard Award semifinalist, and Full Steam just brought home three Good Food Awards. So, how does that feel? Oh, it's it's very satisfying, for sure. Um, both are incredibly rewarding, and um, uh, for us, it speaks to our niche of um, beer in food and, uh, and and working well together. Um, and the Good Food Awards is not something that a whole lot of uh, uh, beer enthusiasts know about um, and, and, and maybe not even a whole lot of breweries um, but you know to get uh, to see Brian receive a medal from Alice Waters of Chez Panisse right uh, the sort of the godmother of of, um, of the local food movement uh, you know to to have my own experience a couple years ago of Carlo Petroni uh, of um, uh, the, the, the head of slow food uh, international do the same for for me. Uh, it's 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 uh, it, it, it's it's very satisfying and and wonderful to be amongst this peers of not only other breweries that have won like Almanac and Jester King and and um, you know no, a number of others that, that have a similar ethos to us for in sustainability and local ingredients and um, uh, and and flavor. Um, but also other makers, um, because the Good Food Awards, obviously food, it, 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 beer is just one of the genres, uh, one of the categories. Uh, the James Beard thing is its own um, curiosity. I have no idea how that all happens. Um, but I, I had received a semifinals nod in, I think it was 2012 and 2013, and then to have it again five years later, after I was like, okay, well that happened, um, and that'll never happen again, to, to have it come in again in 2018 was, well, it's just immensely satisfying. I, it, yeah. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Did, uh, do you oh, know? But I'll also say it was really cool, too, to share that honor with, um, with Leah uh, Ashburn of uh, Highland, mm -hmm. who I think uh, dearly of. Yeah, great. Um, do you have a favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own? No. no. I'm just uh, kidding. <laughs> I let it run. <laughs> 
Feel <laughs> free to continue. Uh, I, I I really love what uh, what what Free Range does um, in Charlotte. Of course, they have a similar ethos, so I'm I'm biased on that one. Um, but uh, it, you know, basically, in any any anything from 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 them, uh, I, I gravitate towards. Um, and then the whole world of uh, of breweries expressing um, local, uh, be it. Uh, Hall River, or Fanta Flora, or Mystery, um, Free Range, of course. Um, Wooden Robot does a lot uh, in that arena. Um, you know, coming back to the Southern beer economy, uh, we 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 were seen as pretty weird in 2010 when we made a beer with local wheat and local basil. That was very far out. I literally got hate mail in my inbox. I literally got people saying, "You you shouldn't even bother." Leave, leave the brewery, leave, leave brewing to the pros, like to other states. Yeah, and, and they listed the other states, which was very strange in retrospect, because they said, leave brewing to, uh, I think it was Washington, Oregon, Michigan, and, 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 and California. They were very specific with who should be allowed to brew, and North Carolina wasn't one of them, right? So uh, to me, that was just motivation, just like, Jockerman saying that uh, you know his rhetoric uh, back in the day with right. Pop the Cap that that it would lead to you know more academic suicides and and um, more abortions uh, all that stuff just motivates you because you know you're on the right track right just like when we in our community endeavors um, people say to us shut up and brew beer the, you know what that, that tells me we're doing something right we're on the right track and so um, when we brewed a beer with local basil and local wheat and people were like what the hell are you doing? What is this madness? We knew that we were on the right track. And the whole idea of a Southern beer economy is that we wanted to pioneer it, right? We wanted to be the first, but economy means that there's a collective of businesses doing this thing. If it was just us, it'd be a Southern beer business, right? But it's an economy. And so um, the beers that I love are uh, tend, tend to be breweries that express that flavor of the South using local ingredients who help fulfill this vision that we had of a beer economy, of a southern beer economy. What would you say Fullstein's flagship beer is? Well, if you have one. What I would say is different than what the numbers say. The numbers yeah. would say it's rocket science IPA um, because people love IPAs. Now it does have 10% local ingredients, has a nominal amount, that's about all we can afford in a mass produced, hits at the store shelves at about 10 bucks a six pack, uh, you know, using local ingredients. There's only so much that we can do there in that arena. Um, the one that, that I would love to say is, is that um, flagship is humidity, which is, um, speaks more to a sense of place, humidity, it is the South, right? Um, we're trying to put a positive spin on what sometimes people associate as a negative thing, but it does make you feel of a, this sense of place. And it also uses triticale, which is um, North Carolina grown uh, cross a hybrid between wheat and rye that's grown in Eastern North Carolina and malted right here in Durham by Epiphany. Um, and then, of course, brewed by us. So uh, that inclusion of local ingredients ups the, um, the percent local in a year-round beer for us that we hope will um, catch on and not just be um, a seasonal for us. We do offer it year-round, but it does have this kind of seasonal push because people are like craving that humidity, you know, because they do that sort of Pavlovian association, which I get the name is humidity. But um, I'm hopeful that over time um, we'll see humidity sales outpace um, rocket science. And what's your personal favorite full steam beer? Um, like these days, what I really love is uh, this, this Dead Nettle Goza. It's part of our Farm's Edge series. So Farm's Edge is exploring this magical space between the productivity of the farm and the wild of the woods, the edge of the farm where like magic happens. And, uh, and this Goza is um, uh, made with a uh, foraged dead nettle. That's a, it's basically a, a, a grass or a weed that grows um, uh, natively and has a, a slightly um, bitter, somewhat minty taste to it, um, and uh, the inclusion of uh, that and, and lemon and uh, Bulls Bay sea salt from Charleston in a very um, refreshing goza. Um, it's a Brian uh, recipe, uh, Brian vision from start to finish. Um, it's just it's just super delicious, and and um, you know we talked about we started with pop the cap. Um, but it's funny that, you know, and, 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 but not surprising, I guess, 
that that the beer that I mentioned is is so not an above six percent beer. It's not. It was never about brewing high alcohol beer. You look at our list, and we have above seven percent. We have maybe five above six percent, maybe five um, on that list. So about a, a you know a third. Like I said, a third of the world's beer styles, right? And right. here we are with about a third of our beers above 6%. So it was never about um, wanting to brew or specialize in high alcohol beer. It was wanting to brew um, the full range of styles that we um, that, 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 that beer affords us. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, my choice is a Goza. It sits at what, 4.5%, I think? 4.7. So anything else you'd like to add? No, these are great questions. Um, I can't. I, I can't think of anything else. Um, yeah, I think anything else that I would add would be self-indulgent. I'm. I'm good. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yay. Well Thank done. You.